Good morning or afternoon for some of you and welcome to Xenotech's webinar, Exploring the Mechanism of CYP3A4 Inactivation by Lapatinib Through In Vitro Metabolite Characterization. My name is Matt Beck and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Xenotech. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Joanna Barbara. Joanna is a Senior Mass Spectrometry Specialist in our Qualitative Analytical Chemistry Group. Before we get started with today's presentation, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Here's an example of your GoToWebinar user console. Using the orange arrow will allow you to minimize and maximize the user console. Please note that your audio is muted. If you have questions during the presentations, please post your questions in the questions pane seen highlighted here. We will have a Q&A session immediately following today's presentation to address questions posted via this pane. Uh, a, a copy of today's slides uh, and recorded session will be available a few days after the presentation. Uh, we will send both links via email for your reference. Um, and so before we begin, I just wanted to uh, apologize for having to reschedule the webinar um, and thought I'd share with you all a few pictures as to the reasons why the rescheduling was necessary. Uh, and I know our friends on the East Coast are dealing with something very similar today, so our thoughts go out to them. Uh, but uh, this, this picture is from my front door, uh, and I want to draw particular attention to the mailbox across the street. That is my neighbor's mailbox. That's about a four-foot mailbox, so um, you can see just how much snow was on the ground. There's only about a foot and a half of that uh, showing. Uh, the next picture is from my back door, uh, and this is the, a tree that has subsided due to the weight of uh, the ice. We had a little bit of ice before the snowstorm started, so the weight of the ice just tore that tree down. So I uh, just wanted to show, share that with you all, you all so you could see why, uh, why we had to reschedule this. So uh, with that, I am pleased to have uh, Dr. Joanna Barbara here with us today. Dr. Barbara earned her PhD degree in analytical chemistry from the University of Florida in 2007. Her research focused on developing techniques in high-resolution mass spectrometry for non-covalent complex analysis. She subsequently joined Xenotech, where she is responsible for preclinical pre metabolism research on drug candidates. Current research interests include the application of accurate mass spectrometry to xenobiotic metabolism studies with a focus on reactive metabolites and metabolism-dependent inhibitors of drug metabolizing enzymes with potential for drug-drug interactions. Her other major area of interest is the development and application of novel analytical technologies, particularly in the area of mass spectrometry for pharmaceutical research. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Joanna, and she can take it from here. Okay, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> well, as Matt said, I'm going to talk today about one of the studies that we've recently completed where we were exploring the mechanism of quasi-irreversible inhibition of 3A4 by uh, Lapatinib, a cancer drug, where we combined some of our in vitro inhibition assays with metabolite characterization work and got some pretty nice results. So I'll start out by talking about um, SIP inhibition and drug development in general and some of the things that we do to assess that and then move on to metabolite profiling, why, when we use it, why we use it, and why it was appropriate for what we were doing in this case. And then I'll discuss a few of the benefits of accurate mass spectrometry, which is one of our preferred approaches for metabolite profiling in general. Once we've covered those things, I'll share a study that we recently finished um, with Lapatinib, where we were able to do some mechanism elucidation of the CYP3A4 inactivation caused by Lapatinib. And there we go. Okay, so CYP enzymes mediate oxidation of more than half of drugs that are cleared hepatically. Um, at one point where we were predominantly dealing with CYP substrates, it was about, it was actually closer to 75%. But the nature of the way that those drug, the compounds interact with the enzyme means that sometimes drugs can interact with those proteins to cause in inhibition or inactivation of the enzymatic activity. Sometimes the drug itself will interact with the protein and, so, and maybe change structure and function, and in that case, it's direct inhibition. And sometimes what happens is a metabolite formed from the drug is actually the cause of the inhibition. And we refer to that here as metabolism-dependent inhibition. <clears throat> 
The reason it's important is it can lead to clinically relevant drug-drug interactions, and so we like to know um, the potential for drug-drug interactions for our compounds in development as early as possible. So cytochrome P450 inhibition has the potential to result in black box label warnings, which nobody wants, but in worst cases, even patient mortality can be an issue, and patient safety, of course, is, is foremost in our minds when we're developing a drug. But ultimately, if this isn't even noticed until post-marketing periods, then we have to withdraw drugs from the market. Two of the very well-publicized cases um, of this occurring are from the 90s. Tephenidine was withdrawn in 97, and Mabefidil was withdrawn the year afterwards, both because of SIP inhibition, but both for different reasons. Tephenidine is a victim drug, and so what that means is that it is very susceptible, clearance of tephenidine is very susceptible to inactivation of CYP3A4 specifically by co-administered drugs that inhibit the CYP3A4. Ketoconazole is a classic example. And the reason it's a problem is that tephenidine is rapidly metabolized to fexofenadine. Fexofenadine is not toxic, but tephenidine itself has cardiotoxicity. And in the case where this tephenidine, which is an antihistamine, was um, prescribed with some of the some 3A4 inhibiting antibiotics, particularly, but also other inhibitors, what happened was the 3A4 inactivator prevented turnover of the tephenidine to fexofenadine, resulting in tephenidine buildup, which ultimately resulted in cardiotoxicity and some very serious outcomes. In contrast, mibefridil was, was voluntarily withdrawn, actually, but it was withdrawn because it was a perpetrator drug. So in the case of mibefridil, the problem is that um, mibefridil itself inhibits 3A4 and 2D6. Um, those two enzymes are involved in, in uh, metabolism of more compounds than any of the other SIPs, and it causes elevated levels of drugs co-administered with it. Well, mibefridil is an antihypertensive, so it is potentially prescribed with beta blockers, and if it doesn't work, um, pretty rapidly, maybe a different kind of antihypertensive would be introduced into, into therapy. And so the thing about it is the interaction between the beta blockers, and particularly with the other kinds of antihypertensives caused by the inhibition of 3A4 and 2D6 by mibefridil, um, actually resulted in patient death, and so mibefridil was withdrawn from the market because of uh, cardiogenic shock. So we spend a lot of our time here looking at inhibition, SIP inhibition particularly, and one of the experiments that we do is, is the way that we approach distinguishing direct inhibition from metabolism-dependent inhibition so that we can get some idea of what's going on with our drug in development. So the way that we do that is by determining IC50 curves. So we look to see the effect of increasing uh, inhibitor concentration or our drug in development concentration on the activity of a specific enzyme at a time as, note, as monitored by a particular marker interaction. And we look to see how much of the drug we need to inhibit the enzymatic activity by 50% and we use different systems and different conditions and compare the effect on that particular parameter so that we can assess what's going on. So in this diagram, we can see this is a hydroxylate, 4 prime hydroxylation of esmophenitoin. Esmophenitoin is our marker substrate for CYP2C9 in this case. And here is concentration of fluoxetine. So we're looking to see how much activity we have set to 100% in the absence of inhibitor when we're increasing inhibitor so that we can establish if we have inhibition going on. This experiment is in human liver microsomes, but we're specifically looking at the 2C19, and the inhibitor that we're looking at is our fluoxetine. So what we do is we run basically three IC50 curves, one without incubation, and then two with pre-incubation. The one without incubation is just assessing the effect of the drug itself in the absence of metabolism on the activity of the enzyme, and those are the uh, filled-in circles. So what we can see is if we just start increasing the concentration of our fluoxetine, we see a slow decrease here, and then a more rapid decrease as we get into the higher concentrations and in uh, inhibition of our activity. And we end up with an IC50 value right here of about 10 or 15. In contrast, when we look to see 
And when we're looking at the metabolism dependent inhibition, one of the things that we do that differentiates us from, from some other some other experimental des designs is we will look to, to differentiate time dependent inhibition changes from metabolism dependent inhibition changes. And so in this case we have two pre-incubation conditions. The idea of pre-incubation is to allow metabolism to occur for a while. But what we'll do is we'll have one with, with cofactor and one without cofactor. So both will have the variable of time involved, but only one of them with cofactor will have allowed for SIP metabolism. And so in this case, we don't see any just time dependent. Time dependent is shown with the white circles without cofactor. There's really no change in behavior. But what we do see is if we allow metabolism dependent inhibition to be a factor, we can see that our IC50 curve, our IC50 value, sorry, has shifted to below one micromolar. So what that would be indicative of is um, increased inhibition as the result of metabolism of fluoxetine, i.e. metabolism dependent inhibition. Metabolism dependent inhibition comes in three main categories. Reversible inhibition where the metabolite itself is a, is a potent direct inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 enzyme. That doesn't mean it's more potent than the parent drug, it just means that it is a potent inhibitor. But there's also irreversible and quasi-irreversible inhibition. Now these present identically in the clinic, but they're based on fundament different fundamental mechanisms. Irreversible inhibition is where the drug for, is metabolized to a component that will bind covalently to either the heme or the apoprotein, resulting in a loss of function. Quasi-irreversible inhibition is a very similar um, has a very similar outcome. But the difference is that in this case, the metabolite is binding non-covalently actually to the ferrous heme ion to prevent structure and to prevent function. So several functional groups are associated with metabolism dependent inhibition and most of them have very clear electron rich sites so you would imagine that they would be reactive. But of the ones that I have shown here, only two very specific functional groups are associated with quasi-irreversible inhibition, the methylene dioxyphenols or benzodioxals right here, and the alkylamines. And current theory says that the methylene dioxyphenols um, are metabolized to this carbene, and then the carbene has this electron pair ready for donation to a coordinate bond. The alkylamines, theory would tell us, are converted to a nitroso metabolite. Again, we now have an electron pair donor sitting right there. So those are particularly interesting to us because we have some feel for the uh, mechanism of inactivation, but we don't know a whole lot about it, so we spent some time exploring that a little bit. So as I mentioned, the quasi-reversible inhibition is based on a non-covalent interaction um, between the metabolite itself and the ferrous heme ion, the ion in the ferrous, ferrous state. So in this case, what happens is that a complex is formed between the metabolite and the enzyme, but it's stabilized by a coordinate bond just between the, um, the metabolite and the ferrous heme ion. It's very interesting to us for a couple of reasons. One, it can be detected with optical spectrophotometry because it is associated with a peak in the Surrey region around about 455 nanometers, although that's subject to shift. And so you can use that as a technique to determine if you have MI complex formation and therefore have quasi-reversible inhibition going on with your drug. But it's also interesting because if you chemically oxidize that ferrous ion to the ferric state, Fe3+, with something like ferrous ionide, that's what we use, then you can disrupt that coordinate bond, kick the metabolite back off, and restore enzyme activity, and that's why it's called quasi-reversible inhibition. But the thing about this particular uh, phenomenon is that all of the studies, up until very recently, all of the studies into this have, mo have relied on optical spectrophotometry to detect the complex. But what that means is that you can't really, there's not a lot of data about what the metabolite actually is um, involved in the complex, you can just say, well, I got the complex from this scenario, or I didn't get the complex from this scenario, but there's no structural information about the metabolite of interest. This is an example of the optical spec um, approach. This is trianamycin, which is a very potent metabolism dependent inhibitor. We use it as a positive control sometimes. And in this experiment, we incubated trianamycin with human liver microsomes. 
we incubated quite a lot. We have 100 micromolar in this case. Um, only 0.1 make per mole of protein. And we incubated it for, in this case, about eight minutes. We normally would go up to maybe 30 minutes. Um, and about every, depending on the experiment, about every 30 seconds to 60 seconds, we will scan the, the range from 400 to 500 meter now. 400 to 500 nanometers, and what we're looking for is any changes in this region right here. So in this plot, you can see this was our baseline. This is the very first scan. This is the initiation of our incubation. As time goes on, we can see a peak beginning to show. And in fact, we end up with a pretty marked array peak in this case. And what you can do from that information, once you have that one, we've confirmed that we have MI complex formation. But you can also take the molar absorptivity value from literature for that complex and then extrapolate an estimate of how much of the complex you have formed. And in this case, we actually saw 0.032 micromolar um, of the MI complex. So alkylamines are particularly interesting because there are so many drugs that include an alkylamine group and because there are so many um, classes of alkylamine drugs that we know cause inhibition of SIP enzymes. Just to clarify so that everybody remembers what I'm talking about for those of you that don't have chemistry in the top of your mind, this is ammonia. Um, the alkylamines are ammonia derivatives. Every time we substitute a hydrogen with some kind of alkyl group, in this case a methyl, then we change the nature of that functional group a little bit. So if we have one substitution, we have a primary amine. We have two, we have a secondary, and if we have three, we have a tertiary amine. And I'm really focused right, right here in the secondary amine uh, scenario at this, at this time. One of the proposed mechanisms, in fact, traditionally, the, the mechanism proposed to result in my complex formation is shown here. It's kind of generally been accepted that you start out, say this is, this is our secondary alkylamine. It's dealkylated to the primary and then hydroxylated to the hydroxylamine, which is further oxidized to the nitroso, which forms the MI complex. Now, we've seen this um, happen with macrolide antibiotics. A lot of the preliminary work was done with macrolide antibiotics, erythromycin, clarithromycin, trolyandamycin. We've also seen it for antidepressants and antihistamines and calcium channel blockers. And not, although a lot of the initial work was done with CYP3A4, we've seen it with a lot of different CYP enzymes too. So this is quite prevalent. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of the work has been done um, sort of indirectly, if you will, in that a lot of the work on MI complex formation involved spectrophotometry for analysis, which means that there's no information about the specific metabolite. And so people took some pretty uh, clever approaches to trying to figure out what was going on with the mechanism in the 70s and the 80s. Initially, one of the things that was clearly established was that for a tertiary alkylamine, Actually, this was done with the uh, prototypical inhibitor SKF525A. For a tertiary alkylamine, the very first step toward MI complex formation is, is MD alkylation. So we know that we're going through at least one of the sequential steps. And this was subsequently confirmed with a lot of the macrolide antibiotics a few years later. Now, in the 70s, um, it was established that since we know we have an electron pair donor, a nitroso metabolite was a pretty good uh, candidate for the metabolite of interest for us. And a lot of this was achieved with heme model and model protein based studies. So in this case, although there was information about the compounds available, it wasn't necessarily a typical biological system or a typical biological substrate. So again, this is still indirect, um, although the evidence was pretty compelling, but there were subsequent, there were other theories that abounded at that time. Um, not least being a nitroxide metabolite as a potential inhibit inhibiting metabolite. Subsequently though, one of the most interesting studies that is out there is, is one from 1978 where uh, Daniel Mansoy showed that you can get the MI complex from both oxidation of a hydroxylamine and from reduction of a nitro group. And so what that tells us is that the metabolite involved is some intermediate oxidatively between those two things. Now, more recently, a computational study was published where the authors established that the complete formation of an MI complex from a tertiary alkylamine 
through a nitrosome metabolite to complexation um, would result, and theoretically it would overall be very, very stable in that it's an exothermic reaction associated with an energy release of about 60 kilocalories per mole. And around the same time, there was a pretty, pretty interesting report of a nitrosooxine metabolite tautomeric pair formed from a drug that, was a, that we already knew was associated with MI complexation, and in fact that was lapatinib. So that was pretty interesting because for a lot of the drugs associated with MI complexation, we really haven't seen evidence of a nitroso or an oxy metabolite. So nitrosos are very unstable. That's why they want to interact in the MI complex. So they rapidly tautomerize to this oxime right here, and Takakusa and colleagues showed that they had detected the oxime metabolite with a pretty, pretty nice series of experiments with hydrogen deuterium exchange. But if we had a nitroso metabolite, the idea is that we would be quite likely to detect it as an oxime rather than a nitroso because the nitroso itself is unstable and it likes to either dimerize or tautomerize. One of the other things that we spend a lot of our time doing here is uh, metabolite profiling. And we use it at various stages of discovery and development to answer different questions. It's pretty powerful. Where we were interested in this case was looking specifically at potentially toxic metabolites, not necessarily potentially active metabolites in this case. So we were looking for metabolites with the potential to give us information about what was going on with our SIP inactivation. But we also spend a lot of our time doing um, design of animal tox studies. We spend a lot of our time doing species comparison. Sometimes we do lead compound structure optimization. And sometimes we take a look at some of the metabolism that's going on so that we can establish what kind of enzyme family we're interested in looking at for further experiments. We're predominantly focused in preclinical development. And in these experiments, we start out by incubating the drug with the appropriate test system. The way we select a test system and incubation conditions is based on the compound structure. Um, we might choose a different way of dealing with a, a very obvious esterase substrate than we would of dealing with something that's clearly only going to be metabolized by SIP. And also it's based on what the aim of the study specifically happens to be. Are we looking at quantifying a very low level metabolite? Are we looking at doing really good structural elucidation? All of those things determine the kind of experiments that we do. We typically will start out separating metabolites from matrix components and from each other by liquid chromatography. We can do extraction techniques, and we do sometimes, but we generally prefer to process the samples as little as possible because the problem with metabolite profiling is you're looking to see what, has turned, what your drug has been turned into, but you don't really know going in a lot of the time, and so there are plenty of unknowns there. If you happen to lose an unknown in an extraction process, you may never know that it was there. So there's no, there's no way you can tell if you lost it from the processing or not. So we prefer to avoid it where we can. And then we detect the metabolites once they're separated by various techniques. We typically will use some spectrophotometric detection technique and mass spectrometry, but if we have radio label drug, then we would do radiometric detection. And we need the mass spectrometry so that we can get structural information about the detected components. We prefer to use accurate mass spectrometry. And in general, across the industry, this is becoming something that is, is fairly routine at this point. We like accurate mass spectrometry for metabolite profiling for a few reasons. Um, I put all high resolution because it is arguable whether certain instruments are classed as high resolution or not, but my background is accurate mass spectrometry, and so I go with the old school definition of if resolving power is greater than 10,000, then it's classed as a high resolution instrument. And we use Water Synapse G2, which is a quadrupole time of flight instrument, which, is, which means it is a hybrid instrument, but the time of flight um, part of it confers the ability to do accurate mass measurements to four decimal places, which is typically what we do. Accurate mass measurements, one, enhance the uh, ability to assign biotransformations and also fragmentation um, quality. You can do things with a little bit more confidence if you have those accurate mass measurements. But in addition, the workflow associated with uh, accurate mass spectrometry is really great for rapidly characterizing unknowns. And the reason is some of the alternative techniques with the triple quad or a Q-trap you really have to do multiple injections and use a lot of different scan types and make certain assumptions about the metabolite structure in order to cover all your bases so that you can make sure that you don't miss any unknowns. 
In contrast, when you're using the accurate mass approaches, they're typically full scan based approaches, so you're typically acquiring all the data all at once, and then you can go back and mine those data to draw conclusions, so you never really miss anything as long as you're judicious about how you mine the data. In our accurate mass spectrometry approach, we are typically using the accurate mass and the fragmentation characteristics of fine metabolites all in one injection. We perform our sample preparation and do a test injection just to make sure our method is going to work. We like to use UHPLC, in fact, on our Synapt we have an acuity UPLC system. The high resolution chromatography helps in a couple of ways. Because we have uh, the low particle size, small particle size, we get better resolution of components in the matrix. And so the better resolution one helps us get better separation for better quality spectral data, but it also helps us make faster methods so that we can reduce turnaround time in that way and um, we can draw conclusions a lot faster than, than you know, with a regular HPLC approach. In addition, we like to use MSC as our first pass accurate mass uh, spectrometry based experiment. MSC, or Elevated Energy Mass Spectrometry, is a way of simultaneously acquiring low energy and high energy data, full scan data, for the entire run. And so that's really useful because the low energy will give us information about the intact compound, and the high energy will fragment the compounds and give us information about the fragments. Now I need to point out that this isn't precursor ion selection um, tandem mass spectrometry. So technically what you get is pseudo product ion spectra. You don't get true product ion spectra. And that's the other reason why we like to use the UHPLC. It can be very difficult to determine the relationships between the fragmentation data and the data um, for the precursors. If you have UHPLC and you have really good separation, then that's not usually a problem. It is somewhat compound specific though. If you don't have really good separation, then you pretty much always have to go back and do the quadrupole pre precursor ion selection experiment. And sometimes we do anyway, it just depends. But the, the great thing about MSE is that we get a really information rich data set right off the bat. So we, are, we don't have to do as much analysis and we can start drawing conclusions pretty early. We use Metabolink Success, um, which is a software tool for sample and control comparison, but we really only use it for that because even today, software is not very reliable for biotransformation assignment, fragmentation assignment. It has a lot of great um, benefits. It speeds things up an awful lot. It helps me review my data in a much more user-friendly format. But sometimes it will misassign things. And so you really still need a scientist to have a good look at the data and make sure everything's making sense. Then we'll do the precursor ion selection MSMS acquisition if we need to. And then we perform the structural elucidation and biotransformation route assignment manually. So this is one of the main ways that the accurate mass spectrometry benefits us. It helps us with biotransformation assignment before we've even looked at, at fragmentation data. And the reason is, with something like a triple quad or a Q-trap, you can really only measure to a unit number. So there really isn't any decimal place measurement. Sometimes people will try and use it with decimal place assignments, but it really isn't practical. And so one of the common mass shifts that we see as, a mass spec, as mass spec people, we kind of think in terms of mass and mass shift and what's changing with our compound. We typically will see plus 14 and plus 16. Those are probably the most common biotransformations I see. Um, and the nature of my job is that I work with a lot of different compounds. So I have to assume that this is fairly common across the board. And the issue for us is if we have a plus 14, depending on the test system we're using and depending on the compound, we might not necessarily be able to distinguish between an oxidation and dehydrogenation, so an oxidation maybe to a ketone, or a methylation event. Of course, if I'm using human hepatocytes, then I might worry about methylation, whereas if I was using human liver microsomes, I might not be worried about it. And of course, if there happens to be no site for methylation, then I have that benefit. But a lot of the time, I don't have that luxury. So what I really need to be able to do is to determine what's going on. And I can in this case, because even though they're both associated with an accurate mass, with a mass shift, sorry, a unit mass shift of plus 14, if you can measure those decimal places, it's a very different situation. Because both of these biotransformations are associated with different changes in terms of elements added and taken away 
from the overall molecular formula, I can distinguish those two very easily. In the case of oxidation to a carbonyl, I actually have a negative mass defect, so that mass is a little bit lower than the unit number. And in the case of methylation, I have a positive mass defect. That mass is a little bit above the, the uh, unit resolution number. So they're very easily distinguishable for me with the accurate mass spectrometry. Now, there are situations where it doesn't work quite so well. And those are situations like if I have maybe a hydroxylation or an oxidation, and then I have a heteroatom dealkylation within a heterocycle. Because in those cases, I will end up with an overall elemental composition change of just plus one oxygen. Well, that obviously doesn't have any difference, difference in mass shift. So in that case, I would have to take the fragmentation data and look a bit further and see what was going on and what conclusions I could draw. But it helps us in a lot of situations. So the work that we did was focused on the tyrosine kinase inhibitor lapatinib, which is administered orally for the treatment of advanced or metastatic breast cancer. It's a secondary alkylamine. You can see the secondary alkylamine group uh, highlighted in red there. It's metabolized by 3A4 and 3A5, um, but we're predominantly interested in 3A4 in this particular work. It causes quasi-reversible inhibition of CYP3A4. We know that from literature. Now, a lot of alkylamine drugs are associated with that phenomenon. We've talked about that already. But one of the most interesting things and promising things for mechanistic studies about lapatinib is that lapatinib is also known to form stable N-oxygenation metabolites. And uh, Takakusa and colleagues out of what used to be Sid Nelson's lab have uh, published some nice data showing that in vitro. But this is also known in vivo with a paper by Castellino and his colleagues. So what we were thinking was that if we used our incubation, our in vitro incubation with ultracentrifugation and chemical oxidation by ferrocyanide, so techniques that we use to explore drug inhibition, and liquid chromatography with tandem mass spec based metabolite profiling, we could use a combination of those experimental approaches to start to identify the complex lapatinib metabolite or metabolites causing the inactivation of the 3A4. And in fact, we got such nice data that we actually published on this last month. So the first thing we had to do was make sure that we could see reverse well, quasi-reversible CYP3A4 inhibition by lapatinib under the conditions that we needed for our experiments and in our hands because everybody that works in the lab or has worked in the lab knows that sometimes when you get the compound it doesn't do what it's supposed to do or what you've been told it will do. And so our very first experiment was looking at the activity, looking at 3, 3A4 activity with a midazolam marker substrate in human liver microsomes. So the first thing we did was measure the activity toward midazolam. This actually is one prime hydroxylation, but we did four hydroxylation as well. And we set the activity in the absence of inhibitor without lapatinib as our 100% value. Then we incubated, we did a pre-incubation with lapatinib to allow metabolism and generate metabolites. And then we redid the marker substrate incubation to see if we had changed if we had lost activity, and we had. We lost about 50% activity in human liver microsomes, and even more in recombinant 3A4, and I'll speak to why we used recombinant a little bit later. When we did ultracentrifugation, sometimes you can see a little increase after ultracentrifugation, but we didn't really in this case. It looks like you might hear, but that's really, I don't have experimental error um, bars on here, so I don't believe that that is outside of the range of experimental error. But in contrast, when we did the ferrocyanide oxidation, so theoretically, we allowed the complex to form and in inhibit the activity, then we oxidized with ferrocyanide, which should kick out, kick out the inhibitory metabolite and restore activity, and that's exactly what we saw with our ferrocyanide treatment. Now we've got nearly 100% activity again. So we were able to move forward with our experiments on, the, on that basis. And then the next thing we did was had a look at the uh, metabolite profile. We did profiling in human liver microsomes and recombinant 3A4 and 3A5. The reason we looked at 3A5 is because it doesn't cause quasi-irreversible inhibition. Uh, the patent doesn't cause quasi-irreversible inhibition of 3A5, so we already have a built-in negative control with this compound. So we did metabolite profiling, and we found about 10 metabolites. Now, on the basis of these data, we can narrow down our candidates a little bit because we already know that the whole reason we're looking at this drug is our alkylamine metabolism. So we know we can rule out the OD alkylation metabolites. They're not very interesting to us at this point. We monitored them anyway because you never know what you're going to see. But the ones that we're really interested in are the red ones because they all involve 
their formation all involves uh, metabolism of the alkylamine group. And so we came up with this biotransformation scheme for the pattern of in, in human liver microsomes and recombinant 3A4 and 3A5. We saw four primary me, me, uh, me, metabolic pathways. We see O-dealkylation, N-dealkylation, N-hydroxylation, and C-hydroxylation, and then subsequent metabolism after that. But the ones that we're interested in, the area that we're interested in is right here because we're focused on the alkylamine group. And so we, from the N-hydroxylation, we saw subsequent metabolites, which was in good agreement with the literature. Um, but at this point, these were just hypothetical. We had to look at fragmentation data and things for some of them to be able to establish what the identity of these metabolites happened to be. So then we were able to do the experiment that we really wanted to do. And what we, st what we did in this case was we incubated lapatinib with either human liver microsomes or recombinant enzyme for actually for 30 minutes so that we had a, a time period where we would generate the metabolites and allow for enzyme inactivation. We also had confirmed at this point that our enzyme inactivation correlated well with MI complex formation by optical spec, but I've already shown some data on that, so I'm not going to show any data. But so we know what's going on with our compound at this point. So now we've forced metabolism of this drug We've allowed time to inactivate the enzyme. And then we perform ultracentrifugation on these components, the idea being that we'll spin down a protein pellet, and then the protein and the complex metabolite will all be in the pellet. Hopefully, you can remove some of the drug and irrelevant metabolites that are floating around in the supernatant. So you discard the supernatant. And then you need to wash the pellet for the same reason. We resuspend in buffer, and we split the sample into two portions. One we oxidize with potassium ferrocyanide, and the other one we just treat with an equal volume of water because that's the solvent for our potassium ferrocyanide. And then, theoretically, that should release the complex metabolite so that we would be able to detect it. And then we perform metabolite profiling on both of those samples. So what we're looking for is a change in the potassium ferrocyanide samples that we don't see in the water samples. What we're expecting is either to see a new metabolite or to see an increase in abundance of one of our old metabolites. So um, I can't compare, I can't say, you know, I have 200 picary accounts of M1 and 100 picary accounts of M2, therefore I have twice as much M1 as M2, because metabolites will differ in terms of ionization efficiency. But what I can do is say, okay, I have 100 counts for M1 in this scenario, and I have 100 counts for M1 in this scenario, therefore I have the same amount. So in this experiment, what we're doing is with the high resolution mass spec data, we're actually extracting out the ion chromatograms and doing relative quantitation of each metabolite in the presence and absence of ferrocyanide. So I normalized all of the metabolite abundances to whatever they were for the water samples with no ferrocyanide treatment. And then the uh, black lines are ferrocyanide treatment, and those are the changes relative to what we used to have without ferrocyanide. Now, we saw loss of a few metabolites, and that's not wholly unexpected because if you add ferrocyanide, you're not only going to be oxidizing the ferrous heme iron, you're going to be oxidizing a lot of other things. This is a pretty strong oxidizing agent. But what I was interested in was the appearance of something new, which we didn't see, or an increase in abundance of metabolites, which we did see. And we saw for both M9 and M10 pretty significant increases in their abundance once we treated with potassium ferrocyanide. But at this stage, although we can say that is a behavior that is consistent with what we would expect if we were disrupting a complex and increasing the amount of metabolite floating around, we can't definitively link that to the quasi-reversible inhibition because there are other things going on. Like I said, perhaps we're oxidizing something to form one of those metabolites. So now we're going to capitalize on the fact that CYP3A5 inhibition is very different than CYP3A4 inhibition. We already established that lapatinib is a quasi-reversible inhibitor of CYP3A4. CYP3A4 is primarily involved in nd alkylation metabolism. The other piece of the, of the puzzle is that lapatinib, while it is an inhibitor of CYP3A5, it's an irreversible inhibitor of CYP3A5. CYP3A5 is predominantly involved in od alkylation metabolism. So we can use that difference to link the metabolites to quasi-reversible inhibition or to, or to 
basically disprove the link between those metabolites and quasi-reversible inhibition. So if we took M9 and M10, because those are the ones that we now, we've narrowed it down to, and we had a look to see what happened with the same experiment with and without ferrocyanide treatment in recombinant 3A4 and recombinant 3A5. In human liver microsomes, we, we saw an increase in the abundance of M9 once we, once we added the ferrocyanide oxidation step. So we knew that. We already knew that going in. But in the recombinant enzyme system, we still saw an increase with CYP3A4. Therefore, when we've disrupted that complex, now we know that we can see more of the metabolite. But in contrast, in 3A5, when I do the ferrocyanide treatment, there's no change. So this would be consistent with a metabolite released from the MI complex here, but irrelevant here because we didn't have MI complex formation because it's a different mechanism. We didn't see that uh, behavior for M10. For M10, the abundance increased with ferrocyanide treatment regardless of our test system. And so what that means is that regardless of whether or not we're disrupting this complex, we still see an increase in this metabolite with potassium ferrocyanide treatment. Therefore, it's probably more related to the ferrocyanide treatment oxidation, and it clearly isn't related to disruption of the MI complex. So it could, never, it could not be the inhibitory metabolite. And in fact, in literature, there is a precedent for NDL alkylation to occur uh, as a result of ferrocyanide oxidation. And so probably that's what's going on with M10. So now we need to look at M9 in a little bit more detail. We've established that M9 is our candidate for a metabolite that was involved at some point in the complex. But we haven't really done uh, quality structural elucidation at this point, so that's the next stage that we need to complete. This is fragmentation data for lapatinib. This is not elevated energy mass spectrometry data. This is uh, quadrupole precursor ion selection data, because once we realized how compelling the data were and decided we were going to publish, we really wanted to make sure we had everything that we might need. So we got the spectrum. We got the spectrum, and we were able to do some fragmentation assignments to help us figure out how uh, the structures are changed in our metabolites. And this is what we see. This part is a big chunk. I like to see pretty good coverage. I want to see cleavage sites across the molecule, but I don't. In this case, it doesn't really matter because what I know is I'm mostly interested in this little guy. And there, there's a fair bit of cleavage going on here. So then this is a spectrum for M9 itself. And M9 is detected with a protonated molecule of 489. So I've lost a chunk of, of the structure. And what that usually means is that you have a heteroatom dealkylation. And in fact, that is what, what I know from the, these data already. I know I have a heteroatom dealkylation. I knew that before I even looked at the product ion spectra. But I also know that I have an oxidation. And I know at this point that I lost hydrogen. What I don't know until I look at these data is, is uh, any potential sites where those things have occurred. So this is interesting because in this case, it's not so much the product ions themselves, the ions we actually see that are telling us the story. The really interesting information came from the neutral losses, the differences between these ions. We see a hydroxyl radical, and we see, more interestingly, a nitric oxide radical. So I know immediately from these data that I have N oxygenation. Now I'm thinking at this point, OK, it probably is the nitroso-oxine tautomeric pair, but I don't actually know that. And the reason I don't know that is that there are three other sites for N oxygenation. And all of these could be cleaved technically to, form, to allow the formation of a nitric oxide radical. And so I really can't be more specific on this basis at this point. So I need to do more work. It would have been really nice if there were metabolite standards available for the oxine metabolite, but unfortunately, I wasn't that lucky. But what was commercially available um, was a set of isotopically labeled standards for lapatinib. So that was really helpful for us. We were able to commercially purchase commercially some deuterated lapatinib here and some carbon-13, nitrogen-15 labeled lapatinib here. And so we did the same experiments and incubated those and looked to see what we could determine about structure from those stable isotope labeled experiments. You know, I'm, I'm a mass spectrometrist. I'm thinking in terms of mass. And here are some basically mass labels, mass um, 
signals, if you will, that I can monitor and follow around to see what's going on with my structure. The deuterium data didn't give us a whole lot of information. And the reason is, we already pre were pretty sure we undealkylated here. We really didn't have any choice to get to the mass of interest. So I was expecting to lose all of this. And I, in fact, that's exactly what happened. This is more interesting because with the ND alkylation, yes, I would lose the two carbon 13s, but I wouldn't lose the nitrogen 15. And that's the area of interest. So that's a really useful label for me. So if I look at the spectrum um, for the metabolite of interest formed from carbon 13, nitrogen 15, and then what I can see is I still have this hydroxyl radical, but my nitric oxide radical used to be 29.9. It's a very unusual mass shift, so I know it's a nitric oxide radical. But now it's 30.9, which means I've incorporated one somewhere. And the only place that that can be is my nitrogen 15. So I've unequivocally established that the alkylamine nitrogen is the site of oxygenation. So we thought about this, and, and we decided that we could look a little bit more into the mechanism in, in terms of the pathway to nitroso formation because we had such a lot of data. And initially we were thinking about you know, the traditional pathway to nitroso formation, but when we started thinking about it in terms of the data that we had, we really couldn't support that pathway. Now in 2010, Hansen and colleagues um, published a paper that showed pretty compelling evidence that in fact the primary hydroxylamine pathway is not the pathway for some secondary alkylamines. In fact, what, what we actually see is a secondary hydroxylamine pathway. And in their study, they, they also showed evidence where ND alkylation to that primary amine might even be a competitive pathway, which makes perfect sense to me because you know, a primary amine is going to be a direct inhibitor, very often a very potent direct inhibitor. So we thought about what we had. And we looked through our metabolite profiling data a little bit more, and we realized that when we compared the two pathways, the primary is on the bottom and the secondary is on the top, we could monitor this pathway right here very well, but we couldn't monitor this pathway. And the reason was, although we nd to the primary amine, we never detected a primary hydroxylamine metabolite of lopatinib. Now, we've done other studies, not quite the same approach, but we've done other studies for other alkylamine drugs in the past, and for all the ones I've looked at, I've never seen this primary hydroxylamine metabolite. In contrast, we do see the secondary hydroxylamine, I already showed you that, and we see where it would go next, which is the nitrone intermediate, and this is established in vivo too. The nitrone intermediate then subsequently goes to the nitrosa, which of course we don't detect, but we do detect the oxime thereby implicating the formation of the nitroso at some point. So we think that our evidence shows us that we have a nitroso metabolite involved in the MI complex and it's formed through the secondary hydroxylamine pathway. So throughout these experiments, uh, we first of all established that ultracentrifugation and chemical oxidation could be used with metabolite profiling to help probe, mechanistic, um, help probe the mechanism of quasi-reversible SIP inactivation. In our experiments, we were able to establish a direct link between quasi-reversible inhibition and the presence of a nitroso metabolite detected as its oxyene tautomer. And the data that we obtained supported the secondary hydroxylamine pathway to nitroso formation over the primary hydroxylamine pathway traditionally accepted. And thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions that might, might be coming. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions regarding Joanna's presentation, uh, please remember to type out your questions and send it in via the questions pane uh, on your user console. Uh, before we move into q and I'd like to share with you all a few upcoming events uh, which Xenotech will be participating. Um, <clears throat> I invite you to join us at these meetings uh, if you will be in attendance, and please feel free to swing by the Xenotech booth uh, and introduce yourself. Uh, a quick note, next week we will be at the Society of Toxicology meeting uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Um, 
We will not have our own booth, but it, it is important to note that we'll be present with our uh, one of our next IND partners, uh, and that's Xenometrics. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Barbara will actually be at SOT next week, so if any of you will be at SOT next week and, and would like to meet her or talk with her, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, quick note, if you're not uh, familiar with our next IND uh, group, uh, I invite you to, um, to visit mynextind.com. Uh, this is a quick picture of our website. Um, it's a group of companies that have banded together uh, to really speed up drug development um, for everyone out there. Um, so with that, I'm going to move into question and answers. Um, Joanna, we have a few questions here, which I will uh, just read aloud to you. Um, the first one says, could you provide an example of reversible TDI? Um, that's a good question. I actually cannot right now, okay. um, but I, I can look into that. All right. Um, and then the next question is kind of a series of questions. Um, it says, do we always need pre-incubation with cofactor to activate an inhibitor? That's the first part. And then it says, can it get activated without the NADPH but during pre-incubation? Yes, it can. Um, and that is a case where either you have time-dependent inhibition, and maybe it's more to do with some kind of kinetic factor than metabolism itself, or um, if the metabolism that is causing the inhibition is non-NADPH, maybe it's non-SIP metabolism. So there are a couple of situations where that can be relevant, and that's one of the reasons that we take the three-curve approach. Okay, and then there's some more to this question as well. It says, can the pre-incubation facilitate the solubility of molecule and make it look like a time-dependent inhibitor, but in fact it is reversible inhibitor but not soluble at time zero? Yes, that is also something that can be an issue. Um, sometimes that can be very tricky to address, though, because the, the way that you might want to address that ordinarily would be to sit your substrate in solvent for a while, in the buffer for a while, and wait, but of course that is still incorporating the time factor, so that's very hard to distinguish. That's a really good question. Okay, and then um, another question is, can aromatic amines be SIP inhibitors? Yes, they can. Okay. Um, we were focused on alkyl amines um, specifically, but there is an awful lot of literature about aromatic amines inhibiting SIPs too. All right, and then it looks like the final question is, have we looked at hepatocytes? Yeah, um, so we have actually looked at hepatocytes for some of the experiments, not, not with Lepatna, but for some of the things that we've done. The problem, of course, with hepatocytes in inhibition is you, in some experiments, you almost want, it's almost too complex of a test system because what happens is you have so many variables with hepatocytes that sometimes you don't really know exactly what's going on. You might get data at the end of the day on inhibition and think, well, okay, so we have SIP inhibition, but there are so many other factors that could be involved. You know, the obvious one being maybe some transport issue that we prefer to do it in human liver microsomes where it's relevant. Now, there are cases where it will be system dependent and you almost have to look at hepatocytes, but as a general rule, when we're interested in SIP inhibition, we prefer to look at microsomes. All right, then we got one last one that just came in, Joanna. Um, it asks, when you ran the spectral 455 uh, shift assay, did you add the ferrous cyanide at the, uh, at the, I think you meant at the end of the incubation? Or, yeah, uh, I, to, I understand that question. Okay. Uh, to just, or, let's see, to just get an early idea of both R3A4 and R3A5 are quasi-irreversible. Yeah, we actually did do that experiment. Um, that's one of the reasons we know that we have to do such a high concentration of potassium ferrocyanide because before the Lepatnik project came on the horizon, actually, it was uh, some work we were doing with diltiazem and things. So we established that um, we basically, at that point, spent some time doing the spec experiment and allowing the MI complex to form and then essentially titrated some of the potassium ferrocyanide to see when we saw um, the decrease in that because just like you can watch the peak form, you can also watch the serrate peak go away. So we did that and we were able to correlate that pretty nicely with our return of activity if we use a concentration of two micromolar. So one of the experiments that we did for this particular study was that particular SIP exp um, spec experiment.
and it's harder to see in this case one because actually the optical spectrophotometer that we use isn't is a little bit old now um, it's not as marked of an increase in, in the Saray peak in the first place as cholelandomycin, so it's harder to see full apatinib when you're looking at the decrease. But it can be done. It's a pretty useful experiment, and, and it, the nice thing about it is it is quick and it's very simple. All right, we got we got time for one more, so I'm going to read one more TGO in, and then we're going to wrap this up. So it says, while comparing ferrous cyanide treated versus untreated samples, uh, did you also look for new species? Uh, appearing in the treated samples. Any such species could represent additional quasi-irreversible inhibitors released and oxidized during the treatment. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, we did look for new species and to be honest, I was really very surprised that our data seemed to point to something that we already detected without doing the ferrous cyanide treatment because I, I mean, I, a little bit of me wonders how is it coming out of the active site. So we initially were looking for new species, but we didn't detect any, and we've done this, we've done experiments along that, that line an awful lot of times, and every time we see the same result, we don't see any new species. Um, and so that's why I started to look at the abundance of the things we had already found. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and get wrap up today's session. A reminder, uh, we will be sending out an email uh, to the email address that you used when registering uh, for our uh, webinar and in that email there will be a link to the slides, a PDF copy of the slides uh, as well as a link to watch the recorded webinar again uh, if you if you would like to do so. Um, so that's going to wrap up today's session. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Joanna Babar for her wonderful presentation and thank you to all of you for taking your time uh, out of your day to join us. Uh, and our thoughts are with those on the East Coast uh, going through a, a snowstorm, uh, which, which we all know well here in the Midwest. So thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.